This is going to be the video on the citric acid cycle, the third phase of cell respiration. And before we start, I just want to give a little brief history, so to speak. Um, around the 1800s or the 19th century, biologists started noticing that there was different ways that organisms could metabolize uh, sugars, and that had to do with whether or not there was a presence of oxygen, so aerobic or anaerobic. Um, when there was no presence of oxygen, they noticed that some cells, such as muscle cells or yeast, um, would produce their byproducts as lactic acid or ethanol, so fermentation. But if there was oxygen present, then they noticed that these organelles would consume that, that oxygen and they would then turn that into CO2 and water. So their products would be carbon dioxide and water. So in order to understand more about this pathway, um, they did a lot of research and discovery and things like that. And ultimately, the citric acid cycle was discovered in a, about 1937 by someone named Hans Krebs. And that's why sometimes you'll see the citric acid cycle being named the Krebs cycle as well. So it was after the, the German biologist who discovered it. So a little bit about the citric acid cycle. It accounts for about two thirds of the total oxidation of carbon compounds in most cells. And its major end products are carbon dioxide, which will be released as waste, and high energy electrons in the form of NADH. And those high energy electrons in the form of NADH will be passed on to the electric tra electron transport chain. So again, we're at the citric acid cycle results in the complete oxidation of carbon atoms in acetyl-CoA, converting them into CO2, which is released as waste, and in the process generates NADH. So its major end products are CO2, released as waste, and high energy electrons in the form of NADH, which are passed on to the electron transport chain. Okay, so citric acid cycle, although it doesn't necessarily use oxygen, um, but it does require oxygen in order to proceed onto the oxidative phosphorylation phase in the inner mitochondrial membrane because there's no other efficient way for NADH to get rid of its electrons and to regenerate NAD+, which is what we need for the pathway to continue to go to move forward. So um, as far as inputs and outputs, Okay, we just came from pyruvate oxidation, and in pyruvate oxidation, we oxidized pyruvate into two molecules of acetyl-CoA. So for the citric acid cycle, we have two acetyl-CoA molecules per glucose that are going into the matrix. We're still in the matrix from pyruvate oxidation. Okay, and then we're going to end up with, and now this is per acetyl-CoA, right? So remember, there's two of them. So all of these numbers right here, we're going to have to double, okay? For each acetyl-CoA, we have two carbon dioxides that are released, and we generate three NADHs, one FADH2, and one ATP. So again, this is per acetyl-CoA molecule, so if we multiply by two, then our outputs for citric acid cycle is going to be four CO2s released, six NADHs generated, one FAD, excuse me, two FADHs, two generated, and then two ATPs generated. Okay, and so here's our overview diagram again, right? We've gone over glycolysis, we've gone over pyruvate oxidation, and now we're going over the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. And this cycle is in the matrix, and you'll see that, again, it generates two ATP, and so you know where that's coming from, one ATP per acetyl-CoA. And then we also have high-energy electrons generated via NADH and FADH2 that will then join the electron transport chain when we get to oxidative phosphorylation. Okay. And here's our overview diagram again, the one that's from your textbook. So the citric acid cycle, we are moving into the matrix, right? So we came from pyruvate oxidation, we have our two acetyl-CoAs, and then we're taking those as inputs and moving them into the citric acid cycle, okay? So from there, let's go ahead and just go through it step by step, okay? Um, so we have, again, this is just one acetyl-CoA, but remember we have two. So two acetyl-CoAs per glucose. 
And then as we go through this, the carbon molecules right here that are in the color blue, those are the ones that will be converted into CO2 in this cycle. And then the ones that are in red, um, those will be converted in subsequent cycles, okay? Because it just it's a cycle that just keeps going and going and going and going and going, okay? Provided that we have glucose that we can continue to oxidize, okay? So as we go through, step by step, we have acetyl-CoA that comes and adds its two carbon acetyl group to a substrate that's already here, which is oxaloacetate. Okay? When the acetyl-CoA joins its two carbon acetyl group, did I just say acetyl? Sorry, acetyl group um, to oxaloacetate, that will produce what we call citrate. Okay, now citrate is extremely important because if you remember from an earlier video when I talked about phosphofructokinase in glycolysis and I said make sure you remember this enzyme because this enzyme is a, an allosteric regulator, right? And um, so it can regulate the process of, of respiration based off of the amount of ATP available. Well, citrate is a participant in that particular regulation process and citrate is what we call an allosteric activator so if we have lots of citrate present then it will turn on the PFK enzyme and allow PFK to continue um, converting the fructose 6 bisphosphate sorry fructose 6 phosphate into fructose 1 6 bisphosphate and therefore it allows the process of respiration to continue happening Okay, and now this whole step happens using the enzyme citrate synthase. Okay, then for step number two, we have citrate that becomes isomerized into isocitrate. And in that process, we lose a water molecule. Now for step three, isocitrate is oxidized and that reduces NAD plus into NADH. And then that also results in our first carbon dioxide molecule that is lost. Okay, in step number four, we have another carbon dioxide molecule that's lost, and we have a complete oxidation again by, again, reducing NAD plus into NADH, and then that molecule, this resulting molecule, will be attached to um, the coenzyme A. Okay, so that's why we call it succinyl coenzyme A. Now for step number five, this one might be a little bit confusing. We have a phosphate group right in here um, from the matrix solution environment that will displace or essentially switch places with the coenzyme A, and that will form a very high energy bond to succinate, okay? Now this idea of taking this phosphate group um, and displacing coenzyme A, that will then be passed to GDP to form another type of energy molecule called GTP, which is very similar to ATP. Um, you know, don't get overwhelmed. It's an energy carrying molecule, and um, like I said, they're just very similar. So the back GTP usually it converts to GTP in. Um, eukaryotes, you know, complex organisms like us, but um, sometimes it will convert it into directly into ATP and that's, that, that you'll normally see in like bacteria or plants. Okay, then step number six, we have two hydrogens that are transferred to FAD, forming FADH2, and then that also will oxidize the substrate su succinate. Okay, now for step seven, we have to add a water molecule to our substrate fumarate, and then that will rearrange the bonds, and what it does is places the hydroxyl group next to the carbonyl, okay? And then for step eight, the substrate malate is oxidized, reducing NAD plus into NADH, and then again regenerating our oxaloacetate. And then once the oxaloacetate is regenerated, that can be used again for all the subsequent cycles, okay? So, um, as we go through kind of our summary, 
diagram then because well, actually you know what let me go back what you'll notice here is that we have energy being lots of energy being produced per cycle right so again here's one acetyl coa for each acetyl coa we are producing one molecule of NADH here, we're producing one NADH here, and one NADH there. So we have three total. Then we're also generating an ATP, so that's one, and then we're also generating an FADH2, so that's another one. Okay, and then if we multiply that by two, um, because we have two acetyl-CoA's, we're actually generating six NADH's, and then two FADH2s, and then two ATPs. And then where do those um, high energy electrons go to? They will go to the oxidative phosphorylation. So now when I bring up this slide again, which kind of gives you the summary, right? We're starting with pyruvate, we oxidize it to acetyl-CoA. There's two molecules from pyruvate oxidation. Then these two acetyl-CoA's will enter the citric acid cycle. And in the process, we release, I'm going to give you the numbers for both acetyl-CoA's, right? So in the process, we will release four carbon dioxides as waste. We will generate six NADHs as energy. We will generate two ATPs as energy and two FADH2s as energy. And then all of those products, minus the carbon dioxide, but all of these energy, high energy products, those will feed into oxidative phosphorylation or, in other words, the electron transport chain, okay? So our last slide here as summary, the acetyl groups in acetyl-CoA are oxidized in the matrix via the citric acid cycle. The carbon atoms in acetyl-CoA are converted to carbon dioxide, which the cell then releases as waste. This oxidation will also generate high energy electrons that are then carried by NADH and FADH2 to the inner mitochondrial membrane where they will enter the electron transport chain. And then finally, although the citric acid cycle is said to be part of aerobic metabolism, meaning it doesn't, um, meaning it needs the presence of oxygen, it does not use oxygen directly. In fact, the oxygen is not directly consumed until the electron transport chain. It's going to be our final electron acceptor, okay? But it still does need the presence of oxygen in order to um, continue allowing specifically NADH to get rid of its electrons. Okay, so that's it, and we'll finish up with the electron transport chain in the next video.